Uh, so welcome everyone to the History of Diving Museum. My name is Julia and this is Sydney Hamilton. She is an astronaut in training and an aerospace engineer. So she's here to tell us a little bit about her career, um, her experience as an aquanaut and how that's helped to prepare her for space. It also ties in beautifully to our current exhibit, which is called Aquanauts to Astronauts. And that's all about the connections between uh, diving and space travel, how NASA uses diving to train their astronauts, how they use living underwater as an analog for space missions, everything like that. So be sure to check that out after her talk. And Sydney, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And thanks for being here today. I'm Sydney Hamilton. This is my news reporter picture, the live picture. <laughs> so I'll be walking you through a little bit about my background, um, some of the things that I do for outreach, my aquanaut experience, and my commercial astronaut training experience. So as you can see, I'll also be going over some of my favorite quotes to keep me going because, you know, you gotta have those sayings for all the times that you're having because I think you look at we look at people and we say, wow, they're doing all these things. They must, they must get it. I will tell you right now, there are definitely times where I have to question, okay, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right move? So taking you through some of my sayings that help me walk through. So starting at the launch pad, launch pad, where did it start? For me, as a little girl, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to be a princess and I wanted to fly, literally me. I would stand outside with both feet next to each other, blanket tied around my neck, arms straight out. And once I was in the ready position, I would try to take off. <laughs> my parents would come outside and say, oh, Sydney, um, what about a jet? What about a rocket? And at the time I was like, I don't understand what they don't get about me flying myself. But not once did they tell me no. So it made sense that I became an aerospace engineer. Um, I also wanted to be a princess. However, growing up, I didn't see a lot of princesses that looked like me. And my dad would always call me his little princess. So I felt it, but I never got to see it. So when I was asked to be on uh, Princesses with Power Tools, hence why I have a drill in my hand, I was super excited to finally get to be the princess I wanted to be when I was younger. So my fun facts are Mulan was my favorite princess growing up and my favorite superhero was Rogue if you are a Marvel fan. But every time I dress up as Rogue, they always thought I was Storm. There's my, if you're familiar with Marvel, it's, it's a pretty funny mix up. So one of my quotes, you are you. Now, isn't that pleasant? There is 125 billion galaxies, 1.8 eight, eight billion people on earth and there's only one of you. When you really think about that, that's incredible. There's only one person on earth that thinks like you. There's only one person who's had the same experience or that's had experiences like you that is you. You can be in the same room with someone and watch the same thing and get two totally different takeaways because there is only one you. And sometimes I have to remind myself when I'm in a room where I feel like, well, I'm probably not the smartest person in the room or I'm not the most accomplished person in the room that all those things, while important, aren't the most important because I'm the only one that's gonna see that problem through my lens and I can provide value in that way. So attach the fin, step two, who guides you? Giving a shout out to my family. These are my number one supporters, niece, nephew, sister, brother-in-law, my granny, and my mom and dad. So giving them a big shout out because they are always there and they are the guiding fins in my life. And then who are my er heroes and inspiration? I grew up reading almost every book about Wilma Rudolph. She was the first American woman to win three gold medals in the Olympics in Rome. And so um, that was amazing for me because that was the first time I'd seen a black woman be referred to as just American. And it helped me realize, oh yeah, I'm American first, especially to the rest of the world when I've studied abroad. Um, Oprah, her impact, she's also from Nashville like I am. So uh, my mom said they actually grew up not too far from each other. So that was cool. We all have hero characters. Mine is going to be Lieutenant Ahura. So I am a Trekkie versus Star Wars person. 
And she was the first African-American woman to play a technical role on TV. And then my future inspiration is gonna be all of y'all as you continue on your journey and do things that inspire you because right now, if there's anything we've seen, everyone is trying so many new things. I was just underwater with Joe, Dr. Joe D Dutieri's mom, who's 80 years old and learned to dive to go to the Aquana habitat. So it's never too late for sure. Um, because of them, we can really thinking about, again, being inspired by those stories. You're, you're who, what, when, where, and why, and what's inspiring you to move forward. Um, so rocket fuselage is all about what's on the inside. So a little bit about my education and what's built me to become who I am. I went to Spelman College and I majored in mathematics. Um, I interned at NASA, GE Aviation, and some research labs. And then I went to University of Michigan, go blue. No, quiet. <laughs> oh, my heart. <laughs> so I went to University of Michigan. That's where I did my aerospace engineering degree. And then I studied abroad in Shaman, China. Oh, go blue. Oh, go thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favorite quotes, I never lose, I either win or I learn. I think a lot of us have to reframe how we view failure. We try something new or something that we never done before, and then we're not automatically excellent at it. And we say, ah, you know what? I don't think I can do this. Um, Henry Ford had two failed companies before he made Ford Motors. Um, Dyson Vacuum had 5,126 failed prototypes. Steven Spielberg was rejected from three film schools and Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken had over a thousand rejections to his idea of building KFC. So when we look at what failure is, it's really just something to learn from. Um, so attach the nose, pierce through the atmosphere. Um, in my career, uh, lots of different challenges in learning. Um, I was a design manager for the, or sorry, a design engineer for the 767, 777, and 777X. Um, I've been a repair engineer traveling across the world, uh, repairing airplanes. So if you've ever been on a flight and they were like, hold for maintenance, they were probably calling me. So I apologize in advance <laughs> for the delay. <laughs> I 3D printed satellite parts uh, for for satellites, uh, doing the design, the stress analysis, and the manufacturing. So I was the responsible engineering authority for that. And in my hand is a 3D printed part, uh, which is really cool. It used to be 300 parts, and it's down to one thanks to 3D printing. The other interesting thing is, do y'all know how much it costs per pound to send something to space? And my information might be... Oh, just take a guess. 50,000. Keep going up. Oh, yeah. 215,000. <laughs> 215,000 is pretty close. It's probably around, it's probably around 150K per pound at this point. Wow. And so it's gotten really expensive because things are expensive. So think about trying to take your cell phone up. Don't sneak it up if you're if you ever become an astronaut because it's it's expensive. So candy, you know? Yeah, candy. Yeah, so it candy actually up. exactly it actually <laughs> adds up. You have to know know the weight. So it's been really cool. So I was the after that I became the responsible engineering authority for composite reflectors, um, helping with communication. This was super impactful for me because during the pandemic, um, you realize how important staying connected is. And so working on those satellites, you finally see like, wow, we do need these things to stay in communication, to even have conversations like this. So it was really eye-opening for me um, during that time. And then um, now I'm a structure stress manager, uh, working on aircraft, spacecrafts, repairs, and Boeing's newest aircraft build. So uh, we'll be doing a sustainable flight demonstrator that will help airplanes be 33% more fuel efficient with an entirely new wing design. So really excited to take on that role. Technically yesterday was my first day, but I was underwater. So that was a great, we were off to a great start. <laughs> um, see the world like an astronaut is something that I always say. Um, so 2% 2 percent of your total body weight 
from your brain um, is your brain. Uh, 20% of your energy is utilized from your brain daily. You have 70,000 thoughts on average and 95% of those thoughts are repetitive. This is important because, and I'll tie it into see the world like an astronaut. Sometimes we go back to making those mistakes, right? And you sit there and you spin on it and you think on it and you are letting that energy be focused on this one minute thing. So if we're gonna have 95% repetitive, thought, repetitive thoughts, we have to start thinking more positively. We have to start thinking of what it's gonna take to make it happen. Or, or I made that mistake, what's the solution now so that I can, I can make this better or how can I not repeat this in the future? So I caution everyone and also encourage everyone, yo, that's a lot of thoughts per day. Let's make them positive, let's make them productive because we can make the change. So the fuel, who motivates you? I showed my family, now it's my wing team. So these are the people that I call on when I'm doubting myself, like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Should I apply for this new role? I don't feel like I can, I'm fit. And they're the ones that will encourage me, but also tell me, hey, Sydney, you need to do better here. And that's important because there's a lot of people that will cheer you on, but as soon as times get tough, it's like, okay, I'm gonna be a little quieter, but I love the people on this screen because they're the ones that will tell me, no, Sydney, I'm telling you, you can do better because I know you. Hey, Sydney, that's not in your values. So I don't want you to move, like I, I'm encouraging you not to move forward that way because you have this moral compass and these values and that's not in alignment. So think about who your wing team, who's in your wing team. It could be one person, it could be more than one person, but think about when something's happening, who you can reach to to say, hey, I need a little encouragement or hey, should I, what do you think of this? I'm moving forward in this way, but it, it doesn't feel right. Can I get a little pulse check on what I'm doing next? So that's what this group of people does for me. And um, some of my real life <laughs> mentors and the importance of them, helping you, another person to reach out to, help you reach your goals, getting those tough situations, expanding your network. And a lot of my mentors have pushed me in ways that I would not have pushed myself. So also think about who's on your wing team and who's there to help mentor you to get you to that next space that you wanna be at. This is my best friend, Jasmine LaFleur. It's not about who gasses you up, it's about who fuels you. And this is where we talk about the fuel of the people and, um, and everything. So 200 hours makes a very close friendship. Don't remember where I got that stat, y'all. <laughs> 150 friendships is what our, our brain can handle. So it's not about necessarily quantity, but quality. Because we max out at a certain point and we run across so many people and we enjoy their space and enjoy their time. But that doesn't always mean that they're going to be in your phase five, which is five people that you spend the most time with are gonna help shape who you are. So think about who you spend your most time with and how they are building you and how that shapes who you are. Okay, I'm ready for liftoff. Um, who are you taking with you? So I like to give back. We talked, a couple of us were talking about it. I'm a STEM advocate, science, technology, engineering, and math. I love doing outreach. So I've had some incredible opportunities. I've been on the zero G flight twice, um, once for a kid's show. Uh, so on the top one, I was, I guess for those online too. Oh no, that's it's okay. For the top one, I was teaching the concept of flight and the bottom one, I was teaching weightlessness and gravity and about parabolas because that's the shape that it goes in when you're going in zero G. Um, I've had the opportunity to be on panels at Comic-Con, teaching about the science behind the TV show, The Expanse. Um, I've done a TEDx talk, uh, how to use your voice to accomplish your goals. Everyone loves a good acronym. <laughs> and in the corner where you see my, my proud parents there, uh, I had a statue released at the Smithsonian, which was a really awesome opportunity because they, as you can see, they're bright orange, which brought a lot of questions. So people were able to come talk to those of us that were selected for this opportunity and speak to kids, speak to adults, speak to everyone about the science that we're doing, how it's important, and really just expose more people to what's happening in the world of sin. 
So Aquanaut, a lot of the reason why we're here. So this was the first time I went down as an Aquanaut. We did a lot of outreach. We did a uh, pizza delivery. It's hard to see, but that is an inside scan of the underwater habitat. And I went with some incredible people. So I am about two-ish, two and a half to three hours out of my most recent Aquanaut experience. So I have been underwater for the past 24 hours. My ears are still equalizing and <laughs> I'm just so excited to be here immediately after. I spent some time with Joe uh, in the underwater habitat and that was an amazing experience just to be able to talk to him. If you haven't heard, uh, Dr. Joe DiTieri has been down there for now, today makes 81. So I was there for the 80th day. He's staying down there for a hundred days total. He's we say, why 100 days? I was like, because it's a round number. <laughs> and he's like, no, because that's halfway to Mars. So 200 days is how long it's going to take for us to get to Mars. And we don't have any scientific study about what it's like being on an enclosed habitat, pressurized habitat for 200 days. So we're halfway there. <laughs> okay, that's about all the singing you're going to get out of this. <laughs> but he's doing research, even when I was down there, we did blood sample tests just to see how, how is your blood impacted by pressure? How, what's gonna happen when he gets out of there? We don't have the research or documentation. So he's gonna be the first to do this. He has broken the Guinness Book of World Records. And I like the way uh, someone said it, 20 times, 27 times over. So 27 days longer than the current record he's staying so that's been an incredible journey learned a lot from him did some other cool science experiments while we were down there and that leads me to the flight suit that I'm in now um the commercial astronaut training experience I trained with a group called uplift aerospace you might if you know um inspiration for Dr. Cyan Proctor is been was one of my mentors throughout this program so while I'm in the spacesuit, she's in that picture with me. There's some people from my crew. Um, one of my favorite pictures in the world is that picture where we're all hugging. You can see we're all at different heights because <laughs> I promise all five of us are in there. But that was the day that they announced that we would be a crew together. And it was so incredible and so powerful just to be there and just go through this journey we did, oh, this is my zero G flight. They said, bring something that's inspirational to you. I play the violin and I happen to have a blue electric violin. Um, that was us in the red Gumby suits. That's the uh, egress training where we learn how to do an emergency evacuation in the water. What do you do if you land in the water and I don't know, a system catches on fire. You can't stay in there. So how do you do an emergency evacuation? You don't know if that water is freezing cold so you have to protect yourself and I will say as I was talking to Joe I was like one of the most frustrating things was trying to tie a knot in those gumby suits they give you the small string and they're like attach this mm -hmm. I had to practice patience because you're trying to go quickly it does not work uh slow is smooth and smooth is fast that is what we continue to say to ourselves and that is what they continue to say to us and it there's a lot of truth in that and then I had the opportunity to send four girls to space camp on a scholarship. So I added them in um, this opportunity. So a lot of incredible and amazing things. So to wrap things up, uh, be the change you wish to see in the world. And we'll go back to the numbers. 125 billion galaxies, 7.88 billion people on earth and just one you to make the change. So. Thank you all for being here for the presentation. Um, remember, you don't have to have it all figured out today. Life's a journey, not a sprint, and enjoy every moment. So ask questions, explore, and yeah, thanks for being here. Stop sharing. So if you'd like to take some time and take some questions, I do have some over Zoom, and if anyone in the audience has interested, you can ask that as well. Oh, it's like <laughs> 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 the okay. 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 training 
through NASA or is it through one of the private companies that are now getting into space or private if company. you could repeat the oh. question as well for those on YouTube and Zoom. Yes. Thank you for that reminder. You may have to keep reminding me on that. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, um, am I training through NASA or one of the private companies? And one of the private companies, Uplift Aerospace, actually is not attached to like your Blue Origins, um, Virgin Galactics, um, SpaceX. They are actually a separate entity and they have a huge push for science and STEM. And so they've actually sent artwork to space and brought it back and then seeing the impact of what did it do to the colors, to the paint. They are doing a lot of incredible things, including an astronaut training program where one person from my crew has actually been selected to fly. And so really excited. I cannot disclose the date yet, but um, very excited for him. And, and we will continue to see what we can do moving forward for the other four. So yeah, good question. Yeah. We can. I have a question on Zoom that asks, how does zero gravity feel like in comparison to neutral buoyancy? Okay, great question. Good. Yes. <laughs> um, so the question is, how does zero gravity feel in comparison to zero buoyancy? I would say if you're not moving, very similar. It, However, in neutral buoyancy, if I need to move left or right, I can just move my arm and I can swim and I can navigate. So if I'm in a space where I'm like, oh, okay, let me get out of the way for something, I'll do that. In zero G, if you don't have something to push against, you're not going anywhere. So the first thing they say is, don't swim, you're just gonna hit someone. So <laughs> the first thing we do is, oh, I need to get over there. We start swimming and you're kicking and you're like, ah, and you're like dodging things. You will just actually stay right where you are if you don't have any force that you can push against. So that would be the biggest difference is, it's easier to maneuver underwater. I, I felt like I had a lot more control because if I didn't want to go somewhere, I could just stop myself. But on the flight, I got pushed and it was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and until I ran into someone else, there wasn't a lot of movement there. It's like you can swim and do all the things, but in zero G, you, you don't get that opportunity to just stop yourself when you want, which on a serious note, it gets scary when you think about it. If you're out there doing the space walk, which is why you have to be attached at multiple points because if for whatever reason something snaps and you slowly drift, you can't swim to get back. You just slowly drift. <laughs> so I would say that's one of the big differences. Any other questions? Well, what was it like when you were down in the Habitat? Yeah. Like it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So it's actually much nicer than, oh, <laughs> it's actually much nicer than I thought. Like there's a microwave down there, which was terrifying for me because <laughs> oxygen in a pressurized vessel plus a match equals boom. Yeah. So then you get down there and you see a microwave and you're like, oh, I have this pizza here and this <laughs> microwave, like, is this safe? And it is safe. It doesn't get to a high enough temperature to spark any reaction. But I mean, they have bunk beds in there. People, I played rock, paper, scissors through the window with the scuba diver. Oh, oh. <laughs> so you get to interact with people that are diving by. There are a lot of kids there that you were like high-fiving on the window. And yeah, it's it's actually really great experience. We got to do science experiments. Um, I did a carbon dioxide experiment using soda and balloons to see how the pressure impacted how big they would get. and. I would say that was pretty challenging. You realize the challenges once you're underwater of having the additional pressure and you don't feel the pressure, but um, I have really great sleep. I guess it's like having a weighted blanket, <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. How deep are you when you're in the aquanap? 22 feet, 22 oh. feet under. So it's repeat the question. Hmm? I'll repeat the question. Repeat the question. How <laughs> deep are you when you're underwater in the habitat? And it's it's 22 feet. Thank you. Who uses the habitat? Say that. Who One uses question. the habitat? Who uses the habitat? Scientists, researchers, people that just want to do something sure. fun and different, tourists. Um, we've gone down there for STEM education. So really, 
anyone who wants to have that experience, you are able to use that facility however you like. And with approval for materials, because you have to be careful too, because anything outgassing in a enclosed space, you know, you want to think about those, especially when you're doing experiments down there. But yeah, it's open to anyone. Jewels under sea lot. Mm -hmm. So you say you did a lot like of 3D printing. How much of that do you see like for the future mm -hmm. of space mm -hmm. travel? Okay. Or, you know, or just there's so much going on with stuff going, you know, people are so focused on going to other planets and because yeah. we're going to die on this one. And <laughs> like, well, can't, you know, how is it that we can have space yeah. travel, but we can't seem to take care of, you know, like plastics in our ocean kind of thing. So. That's true. So two part question. Question number one is 3D printing and how we'll be using that moving forward. And I think that's an important question. Um, during the way we used to do traditional manufacturing, you take a block, you shape it out, you make you, or you forge a shape. And that's important because there are certain um, tools and certain parts that that's more productive for. So 3D printing should not be used for everything. Um, I think we often say, oh, just 3D print that, that and it'll make it, it'll make it better, but that's not always the case. You probably want to use it for more intricate designs, but the cool part about using 3D printing is now we can make shapes that we've never made before. So in the example I was saying before, we need things lighter. Less parts equals lighter. So 300 parts down to one, that's a perfect candidate for it. A large hogged out block, Maybe not, because it, it does take time and they're still post-manufacturing. But I think once we get advanced, more advanced, we'll be able to print out things so quickly. I've seen 3D printed homes. So imagine if we can start doing that on a mass scale on how you can help. The, my mind first goes to, in Los Angeles, Skid Row. Like if it can be something that's economical, maybe helping people and which leads into your second question is all right are we fixing things on earth before we go to space and i think there's a lot of truth to that and this is this is sydney's opinion but we do have to learn to take care of the planet that we're on before we go to the next planet and repeat in errors so i think it's important that if we do start doing that soon is that we put things in place that say, hey, we have to do this sustainably. Hey, we need to make sure that we're taking care of the next planet because we want to be able to continue to utilize both spaces for a long time. And so I do think there's a lot of discussion about how do we make space more sustainable? Um, and there's a lot of satellites going up right now, which is great because people in rural era areas who haven't had access before are now able to have internet and stay connected and be a part of the conversation. However, there's also thousands of dead satellites up there and I don't know how many y'all saw gravity, but it can, it really can be catastrophic if something's not managed right. So those that are watching the satellites and the movements, super important role, but also understanding like, um, I think Millennial Space Systems has a space junk initiative where they're trying to figure out how can I clean up the dead satellites because that's gonna be important. We're gonna to continue to need to use them but their lifespan is only so long. So how do we continue to keep space clean? So definitely a part of the conversation and a lot of our leaders are having that conversation which is why they're developing things like the Space Force. So really good questions. And one more question on Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, it asks, if it takes 200 days to get to Mars, how many days would the whole mission be, including staying there and coming back? That's a good question. I'm actually not sure how long the total mission would be. It depends on what they're doing. Um, unfortunately, the only thing I can say is round trip is, two, is 400 days. <laughs> but so you're planning for a minimum of 400 days. Um, and the thing to think about is, so we just showed you my crew of five. Imagine being in a small capsule, a small space for a minimum of 400 days, right? And you're probably gonna stay there at least a couple of months in order to get the research done that you need. You have your five people <laughs> for, we'll say, what, two years? 
it's really important that you get along with your crew. They do a lot of studies and a lot of research in, in the NASA programs to make sure they're looking at personalities and say, okay, we have two strong A-types. Can they be in the same group? Uh, not if this one's commander. So, you know, just really taking the time and seeing how they work together, which is why they have so much intense training together, why they spend so much time together. But um, it's a really good question of how long is the trip from here to Mars, the total mission. Mm -hmm. Is this mission to Mars still in the abstract? Let's talk about stage, or are people actually moving forward and planning it and looking at it as a reality in the next few years? Oh, it's being looked at as a reality. Wow. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. Hmm? Repeat the question. Oh, um, <laughs> that's why I said I was like, you're going to have to remind me. Um, is the Mars mission kind of in its infantry? infantry stages or is it being looked at as a real viable mission and yes absolutely it's being looked at as a real viable mission um I know that my best friend who's like I actually want to be an astronaut and be slated to go to Mars I was like wow that is an intense it's pretty incredible it's intense and so um yeah they're pretty far along on that Mars mission and planning and getting that executed mm -hmm. Any other questions? Go for it. So how much um, of the things that you study are related to medicine? Do you have a specific person on the team who uh, area of study is medicine or is it just all tied in? That's a good question. So during the training, we actually had a long conversation about this. You can't go through a CAT scan machine because you can't fit that on the spacecraft. And so they were actually teaching us a lot of like handheld medical devices so that you can start doing some of your own checkups. I would imagine there will be a medical officer in that crew, but you also have to know how to take care of yourself in a certain sense, because you're going to go through a lot of biological changes, especially on a mission like Mars, where we have zero data of what's going to happen, how it's going to impact you, and you never know what's going to happen to each individual. So you do have to carry some of that knowledge yourself because if for whatever reason something happens and your medical officer is incapacitated, you all will have to work together to figure it out. So I, I do believe there's medical training. I won't say that everyone is an actual medical doctor though. Yeah. Awesome. Great questions. Okay, so we are going to wrap things up here and I want to thank you again, Sydney, for being our speaker. As a thank you, the History of Bad Museum has prepared a membership for you so you can visit 362 days a year with us. <laughs> Sydney, I will be returning for a virtual talk with us in July, and we do have a monthly lecture series here. It's on the third Wednesday of every month. It's available both here and over Zoom. Next month, we're going to have a pirate speaker, and then Sydney will be back virtually in July. So thank you again, Sydney. And if you guys have any questions, just stick around after, and be sure to check out our Aquanauts to Astronauts exhibit so you can learn more about the stuff that she does. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you all. Enjoy. Thanks to everyone online too.